Yes. Okay, so these are the um, outline of my talk. First, I would like to set the stage for you uh, about some um, introduction. Then I will try to give you the motivation of our work. And then I will talk a little bit about uh, graph neural networks. Uh, then I will present my results. And then at the end, I will give you uh, what are the future prospects of um, our work. Okay, so great. Uh, so basically, I would like to talk about um, part of cosmology that is so-called a large scale structure uh, that is uh, this network of filament of uh, dark matter um, that they form the skeleton of the universe that they are known as cosmic webs. So these structures are uh, often described by a matter density that in this basically simulation that is not also very new, you see just um, uh, dark matter uh, field that basically by the in the first of universe we have this uh, quantum fluctuation that uh, by the time passing they grow and then at the end we have uh, the a structure that we see now in the universe uh, that they host they can host the galaxies so uh, we can uh, compute the statistical properties of uh, this um, matter field uh, and usually uh, we are fine with using the uh, matter power spectrum um, for example in the first part of the universe that where you have the cmb uh, you can define uh, the information that you are interested uh, in the form of a power spectrum and since uh, the uh, this um, uh, density contrasts contrasts are a Gaussian um, we are fine uh, by uh, just using power spectrum all the information are included as you um, the time passes and you use the uh, gravitational collapse to reach this very nice simulation that is um, uh, from a TNG 300 that is a um, uh, embody simulation uh, plus uh, baryonic simulation, so hydrodynamical simulations. And in these cases, that it's in late time, so basically at redshift zero, uh, the, all the information then are not included in the power spectrum. So basically, uh, the uh, two point correlation function and uh, the uh, companion in the Fourier space, that is a power spectrum. Um, they are not including all the information that uh, we would need. And so we would say, okay, we I go to the higher order statistic like um, a bi-spectrum that is a three-point correlation function. But imagine that you need uh, to do some analysis that uh, you would not like, uh, you would like to be sensitive to the parity. In that, in that case also, you uh, like a three-point correlation function is not sensitive. So we can keep going on, uh, but another, um, Another approach can be that uh, you can use um, matter field. You can try to extract information directly from the matter field and uh, without using this compressed information. So on the other hand, uh, we are very interested to see the effect of dark energy on this matter field uh, because we have a lot of different uh, dark energy models. And on the other side, uh, we have the modified gravity models so uh, personally or i think uh, community wise it would be amazing that if i just give you a cosmology model or observation or the halo catalog or galaxy catalog and just by that i can say that uh, which dark energy model is ruling and governing uh, this simulation or observation so um of course we know that dark energy affects this um, larger structure, LSS, that I said. And uh, basically, they modify the distance uh, redshift relation, and they govern the late time evolution of gravitational, gravitational potential in the universe. So basically, all of these uh, structures that I showed you, uh, since uh, they work as a break for the gravitational collapse, so basically they can change the 
clustering of your uh, halo, um, uh, your dark matter halos, and in case also a cluster of galaxies and also the num number counts. So this character of uh, dark energy uh, can be exactly searched in the clustering of larger space structures. Okay. So uh, with this intro uh, introduction, I can tell you that uh, basically um, the standard cosmological analysis based on the abundances, so two point and three point and higher order statistics, they have been widely used up, but um, they don't um, contain all the information possible. And uh, as also Marco said, we have a lot of data coming uh, from Euclid, Ver Rubin Observatory, LSST, and we need to um, determine the different model of dark energy and in case modify gravity. So there is this uh, need of extracting uh, maximum information uh, from um, dark matter field without this comp compressed uh, statistics. Okay, of course, it's a nice idea, but then we um, confront uh, some challenges uh, that, uh, for example, if um, I have this simulation box of larger scale structure, I like cut them in snapshots and then I give it to basically CNNs, right, to the convolutional neural network. But the fact is that since I have just part of information, uh, I would have a lot of sparsity in the data and a lot of zeros in CNNs that they get confused by. And um, in case that also I want to uh, give it to normal uh, dense uh, neural network, um, there is this uh, intrinsic randomness in the coordinates of uh, the halos uh, that uh, it, in, it can be interpreted by the, it can, it can interpret it as a noise for the neural network. So um, also, also these uh, dark energy models that uh, there are within the constraints that we already have are very close to each other. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish, let's say. So basically, so the question uh, that I presented you is that how to extract the whole information available without compressing it. The possible answer would be, uh, so we can use the raw data in the matter field level. Uh, but of course we face some challenges uh, like uh, sparsity of the data and we need to grasp uh, this uh, relation between the components of uh, this uh, larger set structure. Uh, the proposed solution can be graphs. So we have, uh, we can um, assume uh, this field uh, with the uh, dark matter halos or galaxies as a nodes of this um, uh, graph neural network, um, sorry, as a graph. And uh, then uh, we can consider a uh, raw information of a uh, dark matter field such as mass and uh, coordinates uh, for as a feature of these uh, nodes of the graph. And um, we can do the represent, rep, uh, representation of the cosmic web uh, in a form of graphs that contains automatically the clustering information that I was interested in. And, and then I feed this graph basically to graph neural network that are built for this. And um, so such a me method can be used to extract cosmological parameters in a um, likelihood free manner. So let's talk about graph neural network uh, for uh, um, some minutes, few. <laughs> so graph neural networks are a um, class of uh, deep learning methods that they are designed exactly to perform, to perform analysis and inference on uh, data that they are described uh, by graph. Uh, so the information that you would like to extract, they can be in a different level. So like node level, if you want to understand and predict the uh, information of uh, each node in the edge level if you are interested in the relation between the nodes and if and in the graph level if you are interested in the basically the whole structure. 
So uh, what are the, their advantage? Basically, uh, they are able to capture uh, the graph structure of the data, uh, which often is very rich. For example, if you're in our case, uh, it uh, includes all the uh, information that uh, we would like to. Also, we can infer the cosmological parameters from this field that we are talking about. They are able to apprehend uh, global permutation invariant uh, quantities, and they are suitable to deal with irregular and sparse data. OK. So um, basically, we have um, this graph that the neural network should understand and um, somehow understand the relation between them. So somehow these nodes and halos, they should communicate. Uh, in this case, there is this uh, message passing uh, scheme uh, that works uh, in, the, uh, in the case of um, uh, graph neural network that uh, basically uh, you can vectorize the features of each uh, node uh, and um, you put that in the envelope and you pass it to your neighbor basically and it happens this this happens for the whole network so basically for each network in the graph all the uh, neighboring um, node messages are gathered and then all the messages are aggregated via, via aggregation function. That's it can be some, for example. And at the end, all the pool messages are passed through an update function. That usually it can be a normal uh, neural network. So there are many applications of a graph neural network, uh, like in computer vision, uh, social network, uh, chemistry and uh, pharmacology, and uh, natural language processing, and also many others. But like these are the established one that already they are using a lot, and they have many um, uh, applications and also discoveries based on that. For example, in computer region is uh, very nice that whatever that you ha it has a different uh, part uh, that, that they are related you can uh, define as a, a graph uh, for example like an ostrich or this walking wolf that you can see here in the social network is very interesting personally for me that basically by having the relations with the people that you have uh, the relation that you have with um, these people and in the future, for example, you can predict how you would be related to other people as well. And in the chemistry and pharmacology, there were already a lot of uh, advancement on that because, of course, as you can imagine, the molecules, they, you can represent them as a graph very easily. And then you can try to uh, learn and discover about also new molecules that they can be very useful in um, that field. And in cosmology, uh, it just uh, last two, three years that um, cosmologists, uh, they uh, discover the potential of this uh, graph neural network and they are using in um, different cases. Uh, there has been some works on uh, by um, uh, scientists in Princeton that are very interesting based on graph neural network and uh, regression, uh, symbolic regression. That, for example, here you can see that uh, basically you can uh, rediscover the uh, laws of physics and uh, having a new relations of for the physics that basically we don't have uh, some uh, equations that then is due to physicists to, to understand what is this relation maybe nothing but it's uh, interesting that maybe you can also uh, take a new um, discoveries uh, and uh, another case that for example uh, it's uh, for inferring uh, the halo masses um and in this case it's uh, in the a smaller scale in this in the scale of just a cluster of galaxies that they can infer the uh, halo masses so let's go to my work uh, basically i would like to look at a bigger scale uh, and uh, try i am interested as i said i'm interested to uh, understand the different uh, different uh, simulations for the dark energy uh, and i am for the simulation part uh, for the moment um, i used uh, the 
uh, Quixote simulation that is um, full embody simulation that uh, the uh, buff size is uh, one uh, gigaparsec and uh, it has more than eight trillions of particles. So we have enough resolution. And uh, we have uh, 500 realizations at uh, Redshift Zero. I'm interested uh, to look at the Redshift Zero. There are other Redshifts available in the uh, simulation. Uh, but uh, since uh, the dark energy basically uh, affects uh, more at the late time, I look at just the redshift zero. And the, the different uh, parameters of dark energy uh, are uh, these three values that is available. Um, this is uh, like as a proof of concept views, that, but uh, later we are using uh, other simulations that we have uh, the um, uh, access to other also parameter space. Yes. Sorry? Variance. Yeah, uh, the fact is that basically this is a supervised method. So I am using these numbers basically as for training as a label. If there is a variance, I can. Oh, variance. Sorry. Sorry, I heard you wrong. Yes, the fact is that um, no, it's not a problem. For example, uh, I can use, but in, but I'm using the the dark matter halo catalog in the, in this case. And that case, for example, if there is a galaxy catalog, I can use the galaxy catalog because I take just the, the each of these things as a node, and then basically I throw away all the information of the filament and this kind of things. But the fact is that since we are not that much sure on the on the even hydro simulations about the uh, galaxies, basically there are many discussion going on about that. So I'm using for the mo moment just dark matter halo catalogs, but it's possible. It's not a problem. Okay, so um, after taking this uh, dark matter halo uh, catalogs, I um, I need to prepare uh, the graph that I was uh, telling you. So basically I take each realization of these uh, halo catalogs and then I created the graph. Uh, only the mass and coordinates of uh, halos are given to the network as a feature. So basically I'm not using any other information. And then we applied a mascot of uh, seven, uh, 10 to the 14. It's um very huge masses but i am interested in the uh massive uh, halos because uh, they are more affected by the dark energy and the uh, two nodes um are connected uh, and they have an edge if they are closer than a certain distance this certain distance are for us uh, is a basically a hyperparameter and the result that here i'm presenting is uh, for uh, 100 megaparsec because as you can see here uh, as much as i am um, connecting more halos uh, basically uh, the um, complexity of the graph increases and also um we, we are trying to run a like more physical uh, concept for this, but basically uh, the fact is that it's not even very physical that in a box of one gigaparsec, you connect all the halos because basically the ones that are closer, they are uh, in uh, gravitationally bound. And mm, I mean, it doesn't make sense like to connect all of the halos together. Yes, please. Since you, since you already have uh, the, the coordinates of your uh, galaxies and so on in the space, uh, why then you have to recast this information as a graph? Why the representation as a graph is more useful, useful than the initial coordinates? The fact is that the coordinates by uh, themselves um they are not in, i mean they change from simulation to from realization to realization so basically what is important is that they relative distance respect to each other so basically i'm giving you the like i'm saying that basically there are these different nodes there are these uh, coordinates and then since it's um, trying it's understanding the name also then it gives uh, this information if i just give the coordinates for example to um deep neural network it doesn't understand anything because it's completely random for it okay but then why not uh, uh just having all of them and distances uh, 
you're making a cut. Uh, yes. The cut is just removing some information of uh, that you have. Uh, in this in this case, if I need to give the distances of all all the, it's very computationally expensive because you need it. To, you would have the to the power to uh, to the power of n because you need to compute all the distances. But in this case, uh, is not needed. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so the architecture that we have basically is um, I am having the these graphs. And I uh, feeding it to the these graph neural networks uh, that um, each of them they have a different value of uh, dark energy basically, and then I have uh, these uh, modular layers that the first um, uh, box of uh, layers is the uh, edge convolution that is consists of message passing layer, uh, multi layer perceptron, and the pooling layer. Then I have two blocks of uh, general uh, convolutional graph nets that, uh, it, again, it has message passing layer, convolutional layer, and the pooling. And at the end, I have a, a dense layer. And at the end, what I um, have as an input, it can be the class of the uh, dark energy model that is, in this case, is a W0 or the value of the W0 if I'm doing the regression. So other setup of the project, basically I am uh, checking the uh, graph uh, level uh, and I would like to understand it because I would like to understand it, the whole uh, set. And I have 360 realization uh, that they are dedicated to training, 40 for the validation and 100 for the 100 for the test set, and uh, I'm using the spectral package uh, in TensorFlow, and the um, our optimizer is, is Adam, uh, the activation function ReLU, and uh, normal MSE loss function. Yes. Exactly. There are different realization basically with the initial condition that it's a little bit different. Yes, please. Yes, that's, I mean, the fact is that it's nice that um, because graph neural network, actually, they are basically because you have 360 graphs that they are different, like in each, okay, you should multiply by three because I have for each value different ones. But the fact is that the nice part of graph neural network is that even with the very small sample is able to understand it doesn't need that much high because it's very precise. but also, it also can be a disadvantage that uh, they can overfit easily because they say, no, no, they are very different. Like, so you should be careful on that. The fact is that these are like, basically by themselves, they are neural net different graph neural networks that I'm putting them in a certain uh, way that they are passing to each other. For example, the edge uh, convolutional graph neural network, they are used for the point clouds and so on. And in this case, uh, exactly. And so, and then uh, I'm adding the other uh, blocks. I got basically the best result by this combination. I mean, it's, yes. I mean, I, I, by reading, by reading the um, applications of edge uh, convolutional neural network and the other, I said, okay, I would like to have them, but the, the numbers is basically empirical. So we can go to the results. Basically, um, as a proof of concept, first uh, we tried the classification uh, case uh, that uh, first I gave the uh, two uh, far most uh, values of the dark energy for the binary classification. Here you can see in the, um, uh, the table that I'm using the redshift zero and the ball by putting the mascot, I'm having around uh, 1000, um, halo uh, for each realization and the range is uh, that uh, our distance that I was telling you I use for the assigning the edges and you see that the accuracy for the train and validation and test that uh, passes very well uh, so so far so good uh, I move to multi uh, class classification and uh, still I get a high uh, accuracy so then I go to the 
uh, regression problem that actually I am interested uh, because we would like to, as I told you, we would like to, to uh, at the end, have a machine that uh, when you give the um, observation of galaxies, for example, this is the final goal, that uh, you uh, get the value uh, of um, equation of states of dark energy. So in the case of uh, regression, uh, you see here in the plot that basically these are the values of the prediction. These are the values, uh, the truth values. And uh, the data points are the mean value of the prediction of neural network on the 100, uh, 100 um, realizations that uh, we had. And the error bars is uh, this uh, standard deviation of the prediction. And you see that uh, the uh, graph neural network is able to predict um, with uh, very high precision and uh, uh, it has only 2% error. So as a future prospect, uh, which is an ongoing uh, work for the moment, uh, we are using the Pinocchio simulation that we have the control of W0 and WA uh, to apply the same method. And uh, then we have uh, more we explore more um, parametric space of dark energy models. And uh, then I would like to uh, provide the constraint on, also on modified gravity models, so the parameters of modified gravities and uh, the um, um, standard probes uh, constraints. And at the end, uh, we would uh, apply the develop uh, graph neural network on mock, gas, mock uh, galaxy catalogs to provide a forecast for next generation of um, galaxy redshift surveys such as uh, Euclid and LSST. So with this, I would like to conclude that I hope that uh, I uh, convinced you that graph neural network, they can be applied on any kind of um, astrophysical data, which are characterized by point clouds. Uh, the built model that uh, we had here is uh, able to distinguish different uh, dark energy models on the case of uh, W0 with very high, uh, very high uh, accuracy in the binary and multi-class classification, and is able also to predict the value of W0 uh, with the high precision. And then I would like to thank you with this uh, beautiful painting created by AI that recently won the first uh, prize in an art competition. And uh, I think that maybe soon we would have a section in Uffizi Palace uh, that uh, it would say that uh, art created by AI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farida. Questions? to ask how you're doing regression uh, on the w naught value because I, I understood that you have three discrete values for w naught yes realization yes exactly like the same basically the same manner that i do the classification i change the last uh, dense layer that i had and i do the regression basically since it's supervised it can uh, also it can also do the uh, value Exactly. Yes. Thanks. I guess. Hi. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I was uh, wondering if you could compare the two percent error you have to the variance between the different graphs. In some sense, how do you? Because you do multiple mesh, multiple graphs for the same value. Yes. And then you have multiple predictions now with, uh, with some error. In the yeah, process. exactly. Ah, uh, you mean, uh, unfortunately, you less than... you, you're right. I, I, I don't have the plot here. Like you mean that basically for different values, how it changes that, yes. Actually, it depends on the, um, you see that here a little bit that they are like the mean value. It's not always on exactly on the, line that it should be and uh, as far as i uh, checked it depends on the uh, basically the value of w0 and how much the number of um, galaxy the dark, dark matter halos are in that so the fact is that i'm not putting uh, 
balanced data set, right? Because I have different values uh, of dark energy. So I have different numbers of halos based on that. But the fact is that since it is part of the game, I'm not putting the, I'm not putting the, um, uh constraint for having this uh, uh for having a balanced data but i think unfortunately neural networks are very sensitive to the balanced data so they are not exactly the same the uh, standard deviation well from a physical point of view this is one of the cases in which exactly. balancing uh, the, does mean nothing exactly the fact is that i i mean this is something that i'm thinking of how to interpret properly right because it's a it's a problem of neural network but it's not a physical problem so yes thank you you're welcome are there any alternatives to the Kipote simulation that you could simulation you could use to train like some other independent set of embodied simulations i'm asking because i think kind of in this kind of i mean a, as i uh, uh, so it is kind of an, an obvious question, uh, an obvious concern you would have just training up. Sure. Whether you're picking up on some vagaries of yes. uh, specific simulations. Yeah, actually, this is a, um, let's say, a little bit of problem also for me because, like, I would like to explore uh, different kinds, but um, as you know, it's a bit uh, difficult to find all all, all the models that uh, exist uh, in the um, literature to have the simulation enough for training the uh, sample. But in principle, yes like you can use the hydros uh, you can use even the observation is they are like good enough with a certain uh, accuracy um i would say like uh, the models like because pinocchio simulation so is like those kind of analytic one that you can run fast and i am using that to have different values that i want but for example it doesn't cover all the modify gravity parameters that i want Yeah, for example, the one that I, the Princeton group that I was mentioning, they are using camel simulation, that it's exactly hydro, and they have uh, different values, but for me, that, that's uh, too small. It's um, targeted in small scales, like smaller scales. <laughs> a bit far. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, um, then at this point, uh, 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 you would want to know what's the accuracy of the simulations with respect to real data. Uh, That's a nice exercise, but uh, if simulations don't describe real data, then uh, um, we cannot really use this, right? Yeah, yeah, the final goal is using the observation, basically. Yes, but then, uh, I mean, uh, how, how do you know? You trained uh, your neural network uh, okay. on simulations. Yes. Simulations uh, do not describe a real uh, universe. So yes. there at some point, uh, th there is a, a, a systematic error that's very hard to control. Can you try to control it in some Way yeah, to... yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. The fact is that what you can do for now, I mean, when Euclid will have the data, I will try, like, basically, it's a proof of concept that this, this uh, method can be used. And then when Euclid would have the observation, I would apply on that. Maybe my error, they will grow a lot more. And then I would need to fine tune my hyperparameters, but it's what I can do for the moment, right? No, but the fact is that for the simulations that we have, we can apply the observational errors that we have. So there, there, they, we can include it. Like all the story of uh, covariance matrices that you were saying, they are including the noises or the differences from the model that we see. So it's like that. I wouldn't 
like guarantee that would be the best, but we can do it. You have also the problem of to, to handle massive data sets that you have to be prepared in some way before. No, okay, but no? you have to say because you are you are you are training on a different distribution than you will be uh, then uh, using in service because sure. surely the different distribution. That was your point, and I agree. Yeah, it's sort of a balance of. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.